I'm going to invite David to, uh, are you on camera now, De- David? Let's see. Oh, there he is. Can be. All right. Hey, welcome, David. We're excited to, uh, uh, oh, my audio is low. Do I need to stand closer? Does that sound better? If you talk very centrally into the mic, it's, okay. it sounds okay. perfect. All right. I got to get, I got to get used to getting a little closer <laughs> to this mic. So, all right. As you'll notice, I, I switched back to the red team. So I'm excited. But uh, David, uh, hey, wel- welcome to the roundup. Excited to have you on. Uh, I'll let you kind of do some more of your in-depth background, but uh, I've known David for a few years now. Um, he's a he's a, a team lead or a managing director over at uh, Echelon Risk and Cyber. Um, great group of guys and and then and, and gals. And then um, uh, David is just a fantastic, fantastically talented person and, and just an even better human being. So um, David, excited to have you on. Excited to learn more about some red team stuff. And um, I think I think we're just continuing to scare people in to and leading them down the path of like what uh you know what purple teaming is all about so all right i'll let you take it away i dig it yeah uh first off definitely breaking the uh the shirt uh rule uh, i didn't have a, a red hawaiian shirt which was unfortunate but <laughs> minus you know, one gold star is. minus yeah. one gold star um no thanks for the kind words uh let's see let me let me make sure that i know how to use a computer and share my screen um today what i'm going to be talking about is uh, how you have to act like a criminal to emulate a criminal. Kind of a no-brainer when you start getting into adversarial simulations, but you, you know, as, as pen testers make the transition into the red team side of the house, it, it is um, so that's more what I want to talk about today. Before we jump into it, I just want to give a little bit of an introduction of who I am. Uh, as, as Dan had said, I'm the, uh, the managing lead for offensive security at Echelon Risk. A uh, fun way I like to describe what I do is I'm that emulated mob bots of a group of emulated criminals, right? So any of that malicious adversarial activity, I'm just the guy running the, the show nowadays, not necessarily getting to do as much technical work. But on my off time, I am a malware de- developer, uh, not for any APTs or threat actors, uh, just more in my spare time, just kind of enjoy defeating antivirus systems and seeing how far I can bring my malware into Windows. A little bit more background on me. I'm a prior soft or uh, special operations uh, camo guy turned offensive cyber operations uh, guy. Really did this for real with a, a Wild West kind of mentality back then because we didn't have a whole lot of rules. It was really fun. My hacker name's APT Big Daddy. I like to call this out because I think it's kind of a funny backstory about you know who I am, what I do. So at a previous employer, I had uh, I was making malware for a red team and. Somebody came out and installed a bunch of sensors on our development boxes. So I didn't really think about it. Uh, started transferring over that malware for some testing. And uh, the next threat intel brief that I went to, they were like, hey, guys, so we think we may have been breached. And the threat actors calling themselves APT Big Daddy. And I had to stop there and be like, uh, hey, uh, no, that, that's me. Thanks for installing stuff on our development boxes. Uh, that would have been good to know. Ultimately, if you want to follow me on my socials, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter's there. If you want to come support me uh, for my company, Echelon Cyber. And if you want to just come check out me and my friends as we try to teach cyber in a fun way, cyberidiots.com. We have a blog and we're working on YouTube videos as well. Not saying we're going to be the next John Hammond, but who knows? Uh, you know, one can wish. <laughs> the agenda today... We're going to be talking a little bit about the history of cybercrime, how it relates to us as, as red teamers, um, some skills that you should be comfortable with, especially within red teaming, eh, a little bit of technologies. And then on those skills, we're going to talk about commonly passed up TTPs and some quick tips on how you can improve. So let's jump into it. Uh, food for thought just before we do. The goal of adversarial simulation is to simulate what relevant threat actor or actors actually do to your clients. It's not to do like the coolest, baddest thing that you found on the internet or like break that super sweet SSL cert and, you know, see things in clear text. That's cool. But how many like threat actors are actually doing that on your client? Most of the time, they're really looking at, at the monetary value, right? So kind of something to keep in mind as you jump into red teaming. But anyways, on to cybercrime. It's cybercrime has been around forever. I don't think anyone needs to be told this, but it's even earlier than the 80s, people can argue. But I would say the first person to actually be convicted of current cybercrime would be a, a guy named Ian Murphy, aka Captain Zap. Basically, what Captain Zap did 
So this guy uh, hacked into the American telephone company and uh, changed their internal clock so that every user uh, that used that phone company could call for free during peak hours, which was really Robin Hood-esque, right? Like, that's super cool. But that was the mentality of like the 80s to 2000s. It wasn't really about stealing money. It was more about, you know, how do we uh, how do we get the best, the best victim, right? Malware that was written back then was more so to ruin hosts. Like, I don't know if any of you guys remember the love virus, but that was a fun one. So when we looked at cybercrime back then, we really were looking more so in like damages and less so in how much money was stolen. Uh, that started to change in the early 2000s, especially with the uh, deployment of, of LimeWire and uh, Napster, for those who remember those beautiful programs. Threat actors really like grabbed a hold of, of deploying their malware through those platforms just because now you could pay for things over the internet. So you know, early cybercrime really wasn't financially motivated. It was more so motivated by damages and leak status and things like that. That was until about 2010. Uh, 2011, where the Silk Road, Bitcoin, Tor, this all really changed how cybercrime worked as a whole. Threat actors really didn't need to work in a silo to be safe now. Like we had a lot of anonymous ability, uh, you know, Tor with the traffic that way. Silk Road, you don't really know who the vendors are. You just kind of talk to them through other platforms on Tor. And yeah, while we had the ability to track Bitcoin because of the, the ledger, right? Uh, or the blockchain, we still didn't really understand how to track Bitcoin. So people could trade Bitcoin and get away with it pretty easily. Ultimately, during this time, the initial access and compromised credential sales like skyrocketed because they could sell to anybody. Didn't, uh, didn't, didn't cost them anything as far as their own personal security. Right? They could just put it up on a marketplace, say, hey, I'll take 100 Bitcoin, for a hundred uh, remote access Trojans who wants to trade. And that's how they were getting around. So 2010, we can really start to say that this became an industry. It's no longer just individual people committing crimes. It's now groups of people starting to commit crimes that are leveraging other people committing crimes, right? So there's a, there's a, a lack of moral cybersecurity companies out there, I think is the best way to put it. Uh, as well as in 2010, we started to see, or during that decade, we uh, started to see quite a few breaches on government spying tools, which only amplified the tool set for threat actors. If you guys remember, WannaCry got about 230,000, 230, yeah, 230,000. Wow, I can't speak English today. They got 230,000 hosts in a single day because of Eternal Blue. So that was a spying tool for the NSA. It was a pretty good spying tool for the NSA. Now it was in every threat actor's back pocket. And then, you know, in our current decade, it went pretty bad. COVID really did change the world for worse. Kind of sucked for us. Work from home became the new norm. I'm not saying work from home is a bad thing. I work from home, obviously. I'm an extrovert and I still love it. But we needed to ultimately understand this caused a bad time in cybersecurity, right? Because you no longer need to be internal to a, a company's internet to be internal to a company's host. That was a big thing. Hacking a Soho router is a lot easier than hacking your Cisco router or breaking through a firewall into a TMZ and then getting internal, right? There's only one step. Uh, and likely, uh, Deborah from HR or Jimmy from finance, they don't update their, their, their Soho routers. So easy peasy uh, to hack in. In 2020 alone, we saw a 300% increase in reported crimes just from the FBI alone, uh, or from the FBI. We don't know what Interpol's numbers are or other countries, but 300% is pretty big. As well, in this decade, we saw an increase of 358% for malware usage and then 435% for ransomware usage. And kind of to point out the change in the last, really, the last 30 years is now in 2021, about 70% of our breaches are financially motivated in comparison to the opposite, right? So that, that's pretty bad. I don't have to be the person to tell you, you know, when, when it comes down to threat actors, they're looking at how do they get money? Uh, they're not looking at how can I destroy this company, which is probably kind of good on one end. You, you probably don't want to have to rebuild every computer. Ultimately, something else that I like to point out here when we talk about cybercrime is the average life cycle of a breach from identification to containment. It's about 286 days. And that's not from identification or from the actual exploit. 
and getting in, right? The time to get in is about 212 days or to identify that they got in is about 212 days. So about a year and a half, you know, for the life cycle of a threat actor being in a network. So what does that really mean? How does that, that mean anything for us as threat actors or as emulated threat actors? Ultimately, in less than 10 years, we have to admit that the uh, cybercrime industry has changed dramatically. Yet, we as emulated criminals, as red teamers, as pen testers, we really haven't adapted to the new ways that our adversarial counterparts are. Many new red teamers that I see come to talk to me or uh, that I mentor still think a lot like pen testers, right? Uh, a lot of times they're going after domain admin and uh, that's their only thought process. How do I get to domain admin? How do I get to domain admin? When really it's about objectives. Uh, you know, how do I steal data? How do I transfer money? Uh, domain admin really doesn't mean anything in the case of adversarial simulation or emulation if you don't show what it actually means for the client. So ultimately, our priorities and knowledge is, uh, for skills is uh, misaligned with what the criminal world is focusing on. And so we need to take a step back and look at ourselves and go, okay, how do we improve upon that? Uh, I will say something a little bit out of our immediate control is the extremely limiting ROEs and SOWs that we get uh, that don't allow for us to truly show the real threat. If any of you are on a red team engagement that lasts a year, uh, that's about as realistic as it would get. But I guarantee most of you probably are max three months. So we are slightly limited in the ability to emulate it fully. But that doesn't mean that we can't give it its, uh, a full go, right? So let's talk about reprioritizing some skills. Uh, I'm going to talk about three main ones that I see from a lot of people. The first one being programming languages. Everybody in here, I'm pretty sure it's pretty comfortable with Python or has some basic understanding of Python because for some reason, all we do is focus on Python. Python's cool. It's neat. It's a snake, you know? But it's not normally seen in the corporate host. You know, and to run it, you need an interpreter, uh, unless you find a way of taking from Python to EXE. But that's still pretty rare from seeing modules that actually work in Python 3. So we need to start looking at languages that actually run native without additional installation. Uh, every single red teamer, in my opinion, should be very, very, very comfortable with PowerShell. It's, I mean, it's literally scriptable.net, which you could argue is scriptable C sharp. It, it does anything and everything. You can run your malware in memory if you want to, and uh, that'll help you avoid detection. So PowerShell has a lot of capabilities and it's been largely ignored over the past couple of years, despite threat actors still using the ever living crap out of PowerShell to execute their C2s, their malware, their persistence, that whole nine yards. As far as secondary languages, I always recommend like an actual programming language around C. So like C, C++, C Sharp. If you can run it native within Windows, it's good. Uh, quite literally, building your own Metasploit payload loader will get around a majority of, of uh, AVs, even without obfuscation, just by the fact that you are now changing up the, uh, the template just a little bit. I also threw in Go here because uh, a lot of my team really likes Go, and I think it's kind of a fancy language, but you can compile Go and not have to bring anything additional into a Windows environment. So, you know, kind of a, a pick and choose your poison, I would say. Uh, the second skill that I say that, uh, that I think that we really need to prioritize, and this kind of goes back to, to Nick's talk, is, is using like organic communication in Windows domains. Um, you really don't need to use half the fancy tools to get around that you think you do. Windows domains are extremely noisy, and there are plenty of ways that you can blend in without standing out. I mean, Nick gave a great example of using like Jira or Azure, but uh, let's talk about SMB, right? Um, file sharing within a network. That's noisy, and you can get permissions out of it. LDAP's quite literally the most noisy thing in an environment. So running Bloodhound isn't as easily detectable as, as many blue teamers will tell you. 
I, I have definitely run it in just about every environment and avoided detection. Sometimes you just have to go slow and there's nothing wrong with waiting a little bit extra in between. But really, when we look at Windows domains, we have to be looking at ways to abuse things that are organic there. So I, I always say Active Directory is your easiest way to, to prevesc because Band-Aid fixes don't always get fixed overnight. Uh, we're all human. We like to have good change management. But even in the best of the best companies that I've seen, uh, you tend to find somebody who forgot to put the uh, or take out the everyone's domain group from the local admin computer or from the local admin group of some host in, in um, HR, right? So learning everything that you can using like organic communication and moving around using organic communication will actually avoid a lot of detection. The last thing we need to reprioritize ourselves on here is we need to be a lot more focused on objectives and not credentials. I think there's a, a problem when it comes down to how uh, we as, as cybersecurity professionals determine our terminology, right? A uh, red team is now become almost synonymous with pen tester, which it's not. They're two different things. One is practicing how you fight, and the other one is just making a bunch of noise and being the cool script kitty that you possibly can get, right? Red team's all about objectives. Adversarial simulation, being red team, is all about objectives. So threat actors, I, I will be honest, they do care about getting good credentials, right? They want domain admin, but if they can extort a company for the data they stole, they're going to extort the company for the data they stole. You actually give more value by creating a proof of concept for sensitive data exfiltration, then, hey, we found this super sweet new vulnerability. Let me go in and uh, you know, hack into it. It, it. You know, Cool, you found a vulnerability. Patch management's a lot easier than fixing open file share permissions. Uh, just ask any IT admin who had to ever redo their file permissions. Uh, additional to this, right? Uh, why are we not using... C2 programs in every single red team or every single adversarial simulation or emulation. Our threat actors are. Uh, so we need to be doing that as well. But you don't need to spend the ton of money on Cobalt Strike with an aggressive script to avoid like AVs. Working on your programming languages for C, C Sharp, C++, and writing payload deployers for things like Mythic, Silver, Covenant, Metasploit, free C2 platforms is equally beneficial to the client. Ultimately, using a beacon style C2 is going to get you a long way in showcasing exactly what the threat is to, to, your, uh, uh, to your employers or to your clients. So I know that uh, I've just been kind of pounding a bunch of these prioritizing skills things over to you. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm big on like actually giving you some tools to put in your toolbox to get around and, and helping out. So the first thing with our reprioritizing skills is programming languages, right? Uh, it was only like three minutes ago, considering these are quick talks. PowerShell is literally, you can do everything that you want in PowerShell and you only need two steps to, to get started here. Uh, step number one is defeating AMSI, which is a lot easier than uh, you may think. Or you could just do PowerShell.exe tech tech version two. Uh, it's installed by default on every Windows system. Whether it runs is dependent on if there is .NET 3.5 installed on the system. But uh, most of your guys' environments have .NET 3.5 installed. So you can get pretty deep with that. Uh, you can use uh, Matt Graber's cool reflection method for, for defeating AMSI. Works equally as well. I like it. Or uh, all PowerShell is, is just a command prompt with a bunch of DLLs loaded into it. So just build your own PowerShell using something like MS Build Shell or MS Build.exe, which is an organ a living off the land uh, compiler that's uh, included by default in Windows. So, you know, there are ways to get around it. And if you are loading your own PowerShell, just don't load AMSI. That'd be kind of dumb trying to stop yourself, right? Step two is just download your tools. You can do this into memory using like the super known way, using like the IEX uh, new object download string. This is pretty well known by a lot of people. I would say most blue teamers should be able to pick you up from, uh, from that. 
The less known way of doing this would be using something like a com object from Internet Explorer, which is kind of cool, uh, even though Internet Explorer is dead now. So you could use the Edge version of this, but ultimately it's still coming up as a Internet Explorer request and not as a new object from PowerShell. The last way I will say, and I, I think this is the elite way, the fun way, is just use NS lookup and, and pull a text record that you wrote. That one's a fun one, especially if you can figure out how to do it. Uh, I have a lot of fun doing this, especially with just like C2 development. Like DNS is so easy to just get in and out. And a lot of times it's not actually properly being scanned for, is this a problem? So that's, that's all I got on the programming languages. Hopefully you, you got a new item on the tool set. Let's talk about the organic communication in Windows domains. Bloodhound's a thing. You already know Bloodhound. Hopefully you, don't, you know Bloodhound. If you don't know Bloodhound, learn Bloodhound. But if you're looking for devices on a network, don't use Nmap. Port scanning, so easy. Pinging is so easy to catch up, right? If a machine is coming out and going, oh, hey, let me ping a bunch of uh, this subnet. Pretty, pretty obvious. You know what isn't as obvious? SMB. And SMB is really, really nice because it'll tell you, do you have admin privileges on a device? Can you connect to it? Uh, you can even execute various uh, exploits using SMB. But uh, I will say that most of the stuff from like Crack Map Exec will get you caught. So a fun way to actually figure out if you have access to a device is just use Crack Map Exec's tac tac list shares option. Uh, with your username and pass, if you have a local username and pass. If you don't, it'll try it anonymously. But you can get an asset list just using SMB, which will blend in a lot more uh, than using ping or Nmap. If you're on a red team, you should never be using Nmap regardless. It's just too noisy and it's very obvious to pick up. Then the last thing I have on here to add to your guys' toolbox is objective focus, not credential focused. Uh, this is where pilfering data uh, comes into kind of your mental toolbox here. But pilfering is a skill in itself, right? Pilfering is to steal, for those who don't know. Finding interesting files takes time. This is not something that is ultimately a very, very quick uh, process. This is what will take the weeks that you're doing a red team to actually find good material or good data. Uh, it's also something that you shouldn't be using the PowerSploit tool set for with their find interesting files because they're looking for strings like password.txt and others, which can be cool, uh, but that's easily alerted upon uh, from a sim. Uh, there are two ways that I like to go about gathering data. Uh, if you're using DOS, it's just using dir and finding all of the extension for .txt, .doc, .xls, whatever that may be. And then if you're using PowerShell, which is my preferred method, uh, you just use the git child item command with the path and then you know, star, dot text, dot doc, whatever it may be. You can do this within a local file or even a file system. So it really does uh, pull out everything that you would need. Then you just have to kind of figure out what's what, right? Find that uh, Krabby Patty secret sauce uh, material uh, in a doc file or something. But ultimately, this is the slowest portion of a red team. It's something that you guys should be taking the slowest because it can get you caught really quickly. Because if you start deep diving and trying to find specific strings or accessing certain files, continuously accessing files is going to build a lot of alerts because you're doing a lot of credential access or credential calls. So not a great way of doing it. So just look up the extensions, and uh, you'll be fine. It's just long. Ultimately, let's kind of wrap up because we don't have much time. I could talk about this for hours uh, as I do really love this subject. But uh, we have to remember that the cybercrime industry is just rapidly changing. And we, as the emulated criminals, we need to keep up with their TTPs and actions, not necessarily them to us because they don't care about us. To do that, we need to start blending in with the noise. So we need to be using things like living off the land binaries, native programming languages, native uh, communication methods. I mean, Nick talked about some as well. So you know, add those to your toolbox. They are actually how we should be acting uh, as criminals do the same way. Uh, we need to stay objective focused. 
you know, why are you not uh, deploying ransomware or malware on a host? I get it. Maybe ransomware is a little bit of a hard one, considering that not everyone's comfortable with you encrypting a, a machine or a network. Uh, probably should stick to just one target machine. You should be thinking this whole time, though, is like, how could you steal this sensitive data? Like, if you were going to get paid for hacking into this network and get the information that you need, what would you need? You know, how would you get paid? So have that mentality of like, what does the, what would a criminal be doing in, if, if they were in your shoes? Ultimately, a good phrase I learned in the military, this is, a, this is something that we learned from shooting, but it makes sense here for red teaming. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. If you rush things, you're going to make mistakes and mistakes lead to detections and detections lead to uh, you uh, getting kicked off the network and then you have to start from square one. So slow and steady is going to win the race here. Ultimately, that's my TED Talk. Would love to talk longer, but not what we got. Thanks again for having me. Welcome back, that was, Dan. That was fantastic, David. Um, yeah, like uh, couldn't agree more. Like there was some just some great tips. I, I took a lot of notes. Um, huh. There's a couple questions uh, in the Q and A. So has WebAssembly hit the big time for hackers yet? Ooh. That is a good question. Um, I can't definitively answer yes or no because I haven't really looked too much into it, right? But uh, I can always ask my web experts that I have on my team and see what they have because we're constantly like looking out for uh, new ways to, to emulate the, uh, the current attack and threat landscape. I can speak to that a little bit. I can say that, yeah, exploring using some of the more exotic means for C2, I'm seeing and, and doing research on using things like WebSockets and WebAssembly to try and uh, mask. And I can say right now, too, that it's Nissant, I think, but there are some research projects that I've come across and I've actually even started researching. Specifically, I started my research on WebSockets because somebody asked me that question like literally a month ago. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm seeing some projects, but I think it is. So note to all the red team researchers out there, that's a good place to start scratching. I've seen some uh, some interesting things in threat feeds on IoT, uh, not so much malware. It seems like very much APT focused threat actors are starting to try and emulate some of the IoT that's using WebSockets because so many telemetry tools are just skipping uh, that WebSocket communication and some you know some of those uh, WebAssembly ability to combine WebAssembly and WebSockets is something that's coming up. So I can't definitively speak to it either. I've just started scratching the surface. And uh, I think the answer is, yeah, it's coming down. And some nation state folks are probably like, yeah, we were doing that like two years ago, but I missed it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. I mean, so, so it sounds like, Hey, it's on the, it's on the cusp, right? Like, you know, like that's what uh, hackers are always like looking for is new techniques. Right. So, um, and then one last one, I know Caitlin is uh, going to be joining us here shortly. We're excited to get her on um, your best resources for learning or reading up on things like Maddie G's exploit. Ooh, uh, I think there's, there's a ton of, of great just blogs out there. If I had to pick like two off the top of my head, uh, or a three, I would say Mr. Docs, which Nick had mentioned. Uh, you have iRed.team, which is a great resource. And um, XPN, uh, also known as Adam Chester. Uh, those, between those three, you can pretty much find a plethora of, of knowledge in, in hiding your, uh, not only your shell code, but also like executing in the most odd and, and wild ways. But ultimately emulating the ways that actual threat actors are going out and executing. Nice, nice, nice. Um, and then one last comment before we kind of introduce Caitlin, um, if, if for the speakers that are still on the panel and everything, if you, if you are willing and able to share slides, everyone's been asking, can I get the slides? Um, if, if you are, you know, send those over to the team over at Wildwest Hacking Fest and they should be able to get them into the uh, to the slides channel within the Discord server. So if you're not on the Discord server, make sure you tap in there because that's where you'll get the recording of this webinar and the slides for whomever is able to share them. So thanks to me. That was fantastic. Um, great talk. Um, I know everybody was really enjoying it. So um, great work. Thanks a bunch.